Ruth, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nancy. It's good to be here again. Now, the last time we were talking about this, we were just touching on the whole notion of thoughts and how powerful thoughts are and how they affect who we are and, our, and the outcome of our life, the manifestations of our life. Maybe just review a little bit about what are thoughts and the important role they play for us. The thing is that we don't realize the important role they do play in our lives. And one of the things that metapsychiatry has taught us is that they manifest, which means they appear in other forms because thought is energy, it's mental energy. And it goes along a very specific pathway. So it starts with an idea or a concept and then comes an image. So if you're thinking about somebody, you know right away you catch an image of them in your mind. Yeah, and even if you don't know what they look like, you'll make it up. <laughs> That's probably true too. Uh, and then if uh, it, the thought then follows the uh, way of speech or it becomes, uh, appears in speech. And if it doesn't appear in speech, it appears in our behavior. It comes in the form of moods and our feelings and our emotions or our activities. And then it, it appears in the form of physical symptoms and then in life experiences. So a lot of people are familiar with body language. You know, we're, we all know that there's a connection between our thoughts and our bodies. And we learn to read body language very well. But when it comes to physical symptoms, we don't kind of like to hear that. But it's actually a very liberating thought because once we become aware that uh, certain kinds of thoughts can actually turn into physical symptoms, we might become more interested in paying more attention to our thoughts. So and it's kind of like, um, a water vapor, right, that goes from something that is steam mm -hmm. into something that's liquid and then it can even freeze into ice. Into so ice. That it's the yeah. same stuff. It's the same idea that it's energy and it appears in different forms. So what we're interested in, in when we have a spiritual practice is in purifying our thoughts of unloving thoughts so that we, we can manifest health and that our experiences in life would be good. So we so. manifest both loving thoughts as well as unloving thoughts, you might say. Yes, of course. Who or doesn't? valid thoughts and invalid thoughts. That's what we call them in metapsychiatry. And we call them valid and invalid, existentially valid and existentially invalid, as that they certainly are not producing good fruit when they are uh, negative and harmful, unloving, envious, malicious kinds of thoughts. Then they hurt us. But we're not aware that they are actually hurting us. Well, so yeah. help us understand this. Let's take an example. Let's think about, you know, our relationships. We all have relationships that are really important to us in life. And sometimes they become troublesome. You know, we don't know what to do. So how do thoughts play a role? How might that manifest in our relationships? Mm -hmm. Well, relationships are, are frequently in trouble today, as we know. And one of the first things that happens in a relationship is that we blame the other person you have caused this problem for me. You're the one who is at fault. So we criticize, we find fault, you know, we judge, we label, we do all these very unloving things. And actually what is taking place is that we are actually hurting ourselves with those thoughts. It's not the other person who's hurting us, and we think it is. Well, what's the thought? I mean, so let's say someone has betrayed us at work or our spouse, They've done something that really breaks the rule that we had mm -hmm. with them in terms of this relationship. Now, isn't that, how is that not worthy of blame? <laughs> That's the catch. You yeah. see, if we want to blame somebody else, then we're going to try to fix them or try to change them or in some way pretend like it didn't happen. Oh, I'll forgive him and, you know, or her and act as though it didn't happen. But that's not to how to heal the thought. We have to heal that kind of thought. Otherwise, it is going to hurt us. Well, let's even isolate the thought for us, for, for those mm -hmm. of us who are not quite getting this. Um, so what's the thought behind that's blaming, that is that blaming thought? I'm saying, they just hurt me. Why is that not a fact? Why is that a thought? <laughs> it may be a fact. Uh, because we're not saying that their behavior was, uh, was a good kind. Uh, if they're angry at us, for example, and they express it, that's not loving. But we can't change them. So what use is it going to do, be for us to try to change them? If we're practicing a spiritual practice, we work on ourselves. We don't work on others. So it always gets back to us. 
what are we doing that is harmful to ourselves and if we understand that our thoughts manifest in those different forms including our emotions including our behavior including physical symptoms and troublesome life experiences who wants that you know we would like to be healed of that so we have to work on our own consciousness and one of the first things that we can do is to practice actually forgiveness which is in metapsychiatry considered to be a, a little different than I think it's often practiced where we're saying oh I forgive you you know well I forgive you right away it makes a separation between us it makes me sound like I'm okay and you're not okay so instead of that kind of uh, interpretation we think of it as giving up blaming and we refuse to blame anyone not to blame them not to blame ourselves but to see that actually whatever is taking place is under the influence of an existentially invalid thought. That's all that's happening. So let's go back to our betrayal scenario, right? Mm -hmm. So the thought that's manifesting, that's causing me problems, say if I'm the example, is that I want this person to behave in a different way. And I, I'm, and I expected them to behave in a different way. In fact, we had maybe even had an agreement that they were going to behave in a different way. And then here they do something very different. And so my thought is they're wrong. Is that that's at the root of the blaming thought? That yes. There's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with them. There you are. So your expectations are what is creating a problem for you. And actually we call that a should thought. So what you're thinking at that moment is he shouldn't or he, she shouldn't have done that. It's a betrayal. So the moment you start th entertaining a should thought, that becomes a very heavy and oppressive kind of thought to live with. And it's going to hurt you. Now, so yeah. what, are, what are some of the things you've worked with in terms of uh, clients and um, counseling sessions where people are dealing with these kind of issues? What is that transition? Because that seems like such a profound transition between blaming someone and saying, you're the cause of my pain, to acknowledging that it's really a thought, it's really what I want. I'm upset because I want you to be different than who you are. That's a huge shift. It is, and people don't like to hear it at first, and it takes a while. Some people get it right away, and they're suffering enough so that they're willing to change right away. But others really do resist it for a long time until they understand that what they're doing is hurting themselves. They're not hurting the other person. Well, they may be as well if they act it out, but mostly they're hurting themselves. So when we finally understand that we are hurting ourselves in the way we are interpreting what is taking place. It's not what the other person did. It's not what they said. It's what, they, it's what we think about what they did and what they said. That is what is hurting us. So as Dr. Hora used to say, or often said, uh, that the tormentor is not the other person, it's our thoughts about the other person. That's what torments us. So if you can see that, then you'd be willing to give up blaming and to work on your own consciousness and heal your own thoughts. So once I recognize, I say, okay, so I want them to be different than what they are. I want them to behave differently than they're behaving. And I may be able to be very self-righteous, right? And, yes. and have a lot of backup behind me that they really it would be a good thing for them to do it differently. Mm -hmm. But the way it continues to hurt me is because there's nothing I can do about that. That's right? right. I have no power over how they behave. That's correct. And that's so correct. that's really how it's hurting me. That's right. And you can justify it all you like, but that still doesn't take away the thought that you're entertaining, which is what is hurting you. So then what happens? So then I say, okay, I can see that I really want them to be different, and that's my problem. That is your problem. That is our problem. Yeah. It's always the way we are looking at somebody else that is the problem for us. That we really want them to be different than they are, and yes. that's creating frustration and pain and bitterness mm -hmm. and self-righteousness and anger and everything. Yes, it ruins relationships. So unfortunately, that's the, that's the problem. And that if it doesn't ruin the relationship, it is going to ruin your health because we are hurting ourselves all the time with the way we think about other people. Can you so, can say a little bit more about that? So let's say, so I'm saying, this person's really wrong. They're betraying me. They're doing mm -hmm. all these stupid things. They're wrong. I'm right. And let's say I hold that stance. You're saying that that thought, because it's 
it's a destructive thought, it will eventually affect my health. Yes, yes, because you can't hold on to re resentment and grudges for a long time without it affecting you. It'll affect you in many different ways, but also it comes out in the form of physical symptoms. So that is what people don't realize, and that is kind of the new, uh, an alternative way of looking at things today, which is gaining popularity, actually. And it's about time because uh, not everybody is interested in taking medications. Uh, it's become very complicated, and there are side effects, and many people really are striving to live a more healthy life. So this is where it's very helpful to understand that our thoughts are really what is harming us more than anything else. And once we get that, then we're willing to work on ourselves to purify our consciousness. So for example, if you're finding that you're entertaining this expectation, and you say, but he or she should, they should know better. Well, that's a nice thought to entertain, but it's not helping you. So would you be willing to give that up? Well, if you're hurting enough, you might be willing to give it up. So we have a principle in metapsychiatry, the second principle, which says, take no thought for what should be or what should not be, but seek ye first to know the good of God, which already is. Now, we have to understand that when we mention the word God, that we're not talking about becoming religious and going to church. Uh, we use the word because we understand it in a broader sense as uh, an indication that there is a power of love and intelligence that is available to all of us, which will help us and guide us in our lives. And so we speak of the good of God. We're speaking of that love and intelligence. Pagel we talked about before, peace, assurance, gratitude, and love, and all these spiritual values. That's what we're seeking to be aware of rather than criticizing somebody and finding fault with them. So how do we understand that? So let's say I've made that transition then, okay? So let's say it's someone at work who's betrayed me, and I realize, okay, so it's really my thought. They're never going to change, or they might not, I can't control how they change. That's right. But I can let go of expecting them to be different than they are, and I can recognize that there is a good of God that's already happening, mm -hmm. even though I don't understand it and I maybe can't even grasp it yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm willing to let go. So at that moment, forgiveness, you're saying, is letting go of having it be the way I want to have it. Yes. Right? And letting people be who they are. Exactly. And, and recognizing that if it's a harmful thought, that they are not to be blamed for it because they are still spiritual beings. So we separate the individual from the thought. The thought is what is under the, 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 uh, in their consciousness. It's, they are under the control or governed by that particular thought. That does not make them a bad person. It just makes them an unconscious, unaware individual, not understanding the impact which what they have done or do, do has on other people. So you can't find fault with people like that. You just have to realize that there's no one to blame here. There's just a thought. The thought is the problem. Okay, but so here I am, I'm still at work, and let's say someone's telling rumors or spreading rumors or saying lies about me or undermining my work somehow. Mm. And I let go. I say, okay, I have no control over what you do. I'm just gonna stay focused on doing my job. But that's still happening, right? So when you say the good of God is there, then how do I understand that? Well, this doesn't mean to say that you're supposed to lie down and do nothing. It may okay. be very appropriate to address the issue. So, but the issue, first of all, is to heal your own consciousness mm. of the negative thought that you might have about this individual because you couldn't possibly become aware of an inspired, creative, intelligent idea if you are maintaining at the same time a very negative outlook towards somebody. Oh, that's great. So, so it's not just to be passive oh, and, goodness, and no. let them walk all over me that that's somehow, you know, somehow I have that image that that's one of the things we're supposed to do then. No. But that's not it, right? Not at all, no. In fact, uh, forthrightness is what is required, and forthrightness is a spiritual value. So that's his honesty and expression. So perhaps it's ne very necessary to clear the air, to uh, speak what the truth is, and, uh, and that's it. Let it go at that. To talk about how I know what's going on, or I can see what they're, that they're saying things about me that aren't true. That's why, right. what, why is that happening? That's right. But then, on the other hand, maybe it's not appropriate to speak about it. 
So that's the, you wouldn't know that unless you become still and seek to be aware of the good of God. So and then we go to Pangal again. So let's remind us about what that is and how that fits into this process. That's a quality of consciousness which we value very highly in metapsychiatry because it indicates that we're in alignment with reality. We're in alignment with spiritual reality or divine reality. And everything goes well when we are seeking to be in alignment with the essence of our being. And then we do receive the ideas that come that help us to understand the appropriate thing to say or to do. But we don't want to react. And that's the tendency that we all have. We react to everything out of our normal habits of thought. Well, this brings us back to this whole show that we're doing, which is who am I and what is the purpose of my life, right? Exactly. So say what you want to say about that. Well, if you're reacting, you're reacting as a person. So you're interacting in a relationship, self and other. That's all that's taking place. Back and forth it goes. So the communication is only on a horizontal level. There's no divine reality there. There's no God, we could say. There's no omniactive love intelligence. For that, you have to be still. So we catch ourselves reacting and we say, no, wait a minute, this is not the right approach. And sometimes we don't even know that we're reacting. So first we have to see that we're reacting to something. It's really and shifting our whole perspective. Instead of seeing that, that who I am is an individual who wants life to be what I want it to be. Right. Right. We're shifting from that. That's right. To I'm here to be a positive influence in life, to be a positive presence, to let this overarching goodness that is part of all life manifest through me. Yes, but uh, I'd say a beneficial presence mm -hmm. because positive isn't always beneficial. Okay. Uh, but beneficial is always positive, actually. Oh, okay. So that's a nice little uh, distinction there to make. Uh, and, but the point is that if we're reacting, that we have to stop reacting. Mm -hmm. We have to see that we're reacting. Are we aware that we're reacting? We're very often not aware even that we're having a normal, natural uh, reaction to something. We all, often even call it a response. Oh, I respond to so and so. But that's a reaction. Reactions are based on our previous habits. So they just kind of come out automatically. But what we're saying is that we have a higher level of awareness. We have this ability to respond. So we're taking responsibility for our reactions. We're not to blame for them, but we are responsible. We can, we can see things from a different perspective. So once we catch the reaction, then we say, all right, now that we're not going to do that anymore, uh, we can react perhaps quietly. Uh, we can be aware of it, but we're not going to act on it and say, this is when I need to go into meditation now. I need to be still and to seek to understand what is taking place here and what the right re response might be. And we'll know that because and we'll have some kind of inspired thought when we get into that pagal state, when we have right. that sense of assurance and gratitude that's right, and love, then some inspired thought will come in and that's what we'll respond to. That's what we do. That's what makes us respond, actually. When we see something very clearly, the response is just so clear. There's no holding back. It's just perfect. It's the right response, the right idea for that particular situation. And the fact that it works is the indication that it is the right idea. And it comes out of a pagal consciousness, you see. Now this brings into question, so then what is the nature of relationships that we have? I mean, we all want to have an intimate relationship, or we want to, we, we're parents, or we, we are children of adult parents. We have these incredible intricate, complex relationships mm -hmm. that so often feel like our well-being is dependent on them. And so what's the, what's the view that you're talking about that shifts the way we view the relationships in our life and how to behave in them? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there's a lot of pushing and pulling going on in relationships because in the self and other, as we said before, that's what was happen is happening. It's always interpersonal interaction thinking that's taking place. What I think, what they think, and it's just a constant back and forth trying to figure out what's the right thing to do. But it's all based on uh, without God. It's based on just self and other. So in metapsychiatry we have a, a, an alternative to relationships 
which is called joint participation in the good of God. Now that's not easy to understand, joint participation in the good of God. So how could that take place? If you're caught up in, caught in the middle of a, a relationship, it requires one individual to say, I am not going to do what I always do. I'm going to be still and I'm going to become aware of divine mind and what divine mind is trying to say to me. Very often divine mind says, don't. Don't say what you're about to say. Don't do what you're about to do. That's one way you can catch it. Because it's just going to be a reaction. You're just going to be make a demand or say exactly. something you're going to regret later on. Exactly. And people don't realize, as I said before, when they're reacting. So things that, that uh, ways that we can catch ourselves is when we start to call somebody a name, <laughs> when we start to label, mm. you know. When we start to make a demand. When we make demands, when we are judging, when we're being critical. You know, it sounds um, like you're saying that the core problem in relationships is that we expect the relationship to give us what we want, yes. to be what we want, that we somehow expect the relationship to be there for us, rather than what? What's the, what's the other point of view? How can we understand the value of relationships from another perspective? From another perspective, the value is that they help us to grow spiritually because we get into so much trouble with this self and other kind of thinking that, uh, and finding out that it doesn't work, that it forces us to say there is a solution here. It's called joint participation in the good of God. That requires, as I said before, one individual to refuse to react and to seek to become aware of the higher mind of our mind and allow for divine ideas to occur that would solve the problem, whatever the problem is. So uh, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, I wonder if there's another set of words that you can put to joint participation in the good of God. I mean, well, is there another way for us to understand that? Yes, actually, you could say there, there's a difference between interaction and what we call omniaction. So interaction is the interpersonal communication, and omniaction is when the idea is communicated from divine mind directly to consciousness. So we are interested in living in a way that allows omni-action to be present all the time. So that keeps us from getting caught up in interaction experiences. So you're saying instead of <coughs> wanting a relationship to give us what we want, or that we're here to completely serve another person, which, which is another way that it could be, that we're really in this relationship so that we can both have a deeper realization of what's really true. That's right, that's right. So we support each other's spiritual growth rather than uh, getting angry at each other for not fulfilling our expectations and not providing the happiness that we thought we were gonna get with that person 100% of the time. All of a sudden we realize, no, wait a minute, that's not the purpose of our life. We're here as individuals. Each one of us is being unfolded by God individually our own unique gifts and talents are being unfolded. There's no comparison thinking. There's no envy. There's no jealousy. All those the rivalry that takes place between partners and in marriage and in parenting and all these things, <clears throat> those are just dissolved when you see your life in a completely different way as being here for God. And each of us is here for God. Every single individual is a divine idea born in the mind of God each one of us here to manifest God in the world. So how can there be any, any competition? How can there be any rivalry? How can there be any negativity? How can there be any criticism? You see, when you see your life in that larger context, and then when we describe joint participation in the good of God, each individual is free to be as close together or as far apart as the, as the moment happens to dictate, but there's always the awareness that our, the purpose of our life is to manifest God and not to please each other. We're not here for each other as much as we'd like to be or think well, we should be. say that again one more time because that really sums up again, brings us right back to our theme, which is who am I and what is the purpose of our life? And you just said it so beautifully, which is we are, what? Tell us again, so remind us. A divine idea, is that we? what you meant? Yes. We're, we're a divine idea born in the mind of God. Each one of us here to express the good of God in a unique way. And so there can be no competition, there can be no negativity, there can be no criticism, 
There is just an appreciation of the life form that has the ability to be consciously aware of God directly and to manifest it in the world in a beneficial way that blesses themselves as well as everybody else. Well, on that so, note, our show is over. You've done another great job of helping us understand the nature of relationships and the nature of thoughts and how that affects our lives. So thank you, Ruth, for being here again. You're welcome. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you for listening. This is Nancy Rosanoff with The Listening Place saying bye for now.